Benin, one in Virginia, and one in Liverpool, created a triangle on his tour. But he didn't stop there. The next year, in the year 2000, he sent a delegation to the United States to do the same thing, to apologize, seek, forgive, seek forgiveness, and reconciliation for their country's participation in the slave trade. They said this, in the name of the government of the people of Benin, on behalf of the President Matia Kirikau, I say to you all, we are sorry, we are deeply, deeply sorry. President Kirikau knows the damage on our side that came from slavery. He knows how this robbed our own society at home, how it turned us against each other. And we believe it is easy to say that those other people did it, but we also believe that if we were not helping them, if we did not assist them, if we did not play a role in it, it would not have happened. Those are profound statements, ladies and gentlemen, from the president of an African nation. And the media didn't want you guys to hear anything about this. None whatsoever. See, slavery, race, racism, political correctness, white guilt, all these things, it has nothing to do with black versus white. It is not a black versus white issue. It is, ladies and gentlemen, a good versus evil issue. A good versus evil issue. And the important thing is, is we need to come together, regardless of the color of our skins, on the side of good versus evil. And if they hide this information from us, what side are they on? What side are they protecting? Evil. It's all about control. The Atlantic slave trade, Portugal exported 5.6 million slaves out of Africa. 5.6 million. Great Britain, about 3.25 million. France, about 1.3 million. Spain, about 1.1 million. The Netherlands, 550,000. And into the U.S., 305,000. About 5% of all the slave trade, 305,000. So how is it that we are still stuck with the monkey on our back, with that particular issue still eating away at our society? The issue of slavery, race, racism, why is it still here? The rest of the world has already forgotten about all this stuff. They've already moved on. Portugal exported 5.6 million slaves, 5.6 million. They're the ones that should be answering for all of this stuff. 5.6 million, and yet, Nobody's talking about Portugal. Everybody's talking about us. What's the difference? We have Al Shaw. That's true. <laughs> and by the way, you're very close. What's the difference between them and us? There's one difference that we've been able to find in the, in the slave trade that differentiates the slave-holding nations from each other, us and them. It is this. In 1691, Virginia passed this law that said, whatsoever English or other white man or woman being free shall intermarry with a Negro, mulatto, or Indian man or woman bond or free shall within three months after such marriage be banished from this dominion forever. This is the first anti-miscegenation law that said that black people couldn't marry white people whether they were free or not. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the color line. 1691. Can anybody tell me, I mean you can shout it out, that's fine. Can anybody tell me when this law, this kind of a law, became unconstitutional in the United States of America? 64? The year that I was born, 1967. It's 275 years of the color line. It did not cross the Atlantic. It didn't go into the West Indies. It didn't go into South America. It only existed in the colonies. The color line. That's what we've been fighting this entire time. Nobody else carried it. We did. Other countries tried to. Apartheid, they tried to. The Nazis, they tried to. 275 years of the color line here in America. Martin Luther King Jr. said once, 
we have learned in the course of our freedom struggle that the needs of the 20 million Negroes are not truly separable from the needs of the 200 million whites and Negroes, all of whom would benefit from a colorblind land of plenty. We have learned, not, you know, it just came to me, we have learned, and had to go through a process and learn to understand that it is the color line, the division of black and white, that is what, that's what was hurting America. And once you get a rid of that color line, and there is no more black and white, guess what we all are, just We're all Americans. By the way, who, who, here, um, who here has ever owned a slave? Raise your hand, please. And I'm not talking about your husband's ladies. <laughs> there you go, just kids, right? Never. Nobody here has ever owned a slave. So my question is, then what if you're white, what do you have to feel guilty about? You never owned a slave. No, you shouldn't, right? There should, no, should not be any white guilt about slavery because you never owned a slave. Who here has ever studied, raise your hands, ever studied slave laws in school? Please, if you can, look around and see how many hands are raised. Okay. My question is, uh, your tea partiers here are all fighting for one thing, and you've heard it all day long. One word. This one word defines American exceptionalism. It is what everybody else in the world is fighting to have. And we have it here, and that's what we're fighting, what we're fighting for. That one word is freedom. That's what we're fighting for. The opposite of freedom is slavery. The ultimate form of tyranny is slavery. And we don't study it here in the United States of America. How are our kids supposed to see tyranny coming at them if they never, ever study it? How do they know what tyranny looks like if they never, ever study it? I'm going to go through a couple of slave laws with you and try to get you a, give you an example of what I'm talking about. The first, and this defines, this is a, this is a, it actually came out in 1662, uh, and this is a repeat of it in 1705, that all children born in this country shall be held bond or free according to the condition of their mother. So if your mother was a slave, and you're born, then you're born a slave. If your mother was free, then you're born free. This law basically says that another entity or another individual can determine your worth before you're even born. You understand that? You're not even born yet. Another entity or an individual can determine your worth before you're even born. This is a slave law. Please, ladies and gentlemen, anybody, tell me where that exists in our society today. I just heard it. Who said it? Abortion. Exactly. Derived from a slave law. That is not God, and it's not you as an individual. It is something outside of you. Another entity or another individual that can determine your worth before you're even born. If our kids study slave laws like this, might they have a different outlook on abortion? Yeah. But we don't study slave laws, do we? We don't study slave laws because, in my opinion, of white guilt. We're supposed to be feel guilty about it, so we don't talk about it. Us, us, we won't talk. That all servants imported and brought into this country by sea or land who are not Christians in their native country shall be accounted and be slaves. It said nothing about the, uh, the person's, the color of a person's skin. Nothing about that at all. Automatically slave if you are not a Christian in your native country. That no minister of the Church of England or other minister shall hereafter wittingly presume to marry a white man but a Negro or a mulatto woman, or vice versa. These are laws passed to control people with unintended consequences. This is the government going into the church 
and telling them how to do their business. Does that sound familiar? Remember I told you I was banned from the Catholic Archdiocese of Cincinnati? I said because my speech was too political. So they couldn't hear my, they couldn't hear the truth because it was too political. Oh, the word mulatto there, it came out in 1691 also, the word mulatto. What does the word mulatto mean if you see it in a law? What do you think that means? If, you're, if, you get, if they actually put it into a law, that means there's a lot of them. It means there's plenty of them, plenty enough that you have to put them into a law and, quote unquote, control them. So people were mixing freely before the color line. That baptism of slaves does not exempt them from bondage. Basically means, thank you very much for accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now please go back to work. That's basically what it says. But you must understand this. The color line, the, the slavery, the institution of slavery remained absolutely solid. There was no chink in that armor. You could not take it down. It was an institution. It was a fact of life all the way up until our founding fathers. Maybe this is some of the reason why they don't want to talk about pre-1865. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. 1776, was it true? They died for it? They fought and died for those statements. Was it true? I have no's, do I have any yeses? Yeah, he was paid on the way. Any yeses? You see, I believe that this, one of the, this is one of the reasons why they don't want to go back this far. They don't want to talk about the Declaration of Independence. Because it was true, in principle, but not yet in practice. You see, the Declaration of Independence, and you probably have gotten some copies out there, is just a list of grievances against the king. And it says that we don't like this, we don't like this, we don't like this. It's basically just defining what we want to be, what we don't want, and essentially what, we, what kind of country we want to be. The idea that all men are created equal defines individual freedom, and it defines equal liberty. Not only for the United States of America, but as an example for the entire world. That we get our rights from God, and it is a direct line from God to us. There is no fork in the road, there's no detour. Nobody can come in and snatch it. It is a direct line. You don't get your rights from another person. You do not get your rights from government. They come from God. And every single grade schooler on up needs to understand that concept. Because I'm not the first one that's gonna, that's gonna say this because it's been repeated today already that if you get your rights from somebody else, well, they can take them away at any time. And that will lead to tyranny. The second we lose our Declaration of Independence, we're on the road to tyranny. What, what, what did the Founding Fathers want for this country? And these are some of the things that, like I said, are just plucked out of the history books. So our kids don't understand what they really wanted. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, this particular grievance. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating his most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant land who never offended him. Captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. That's an anti-slavery declaration. It's an anti-slavery grievance that he wanted to put in the Declaration of Independence. Now, mind you, every slave is worth anywhere from $500 to $2,000 each. They say that Thomas Jefferson had upwards of 200 slaves. You can do the math. It's a lot of money. And yet, Thomas Jefferson writes this anti-slavery grievance to put in the Declaration of Independence to say that you brought it here, we don't want it anymore. Of the 13 states to vote on this, how many do you think 
voted in the affirmative, sure, we'll take it. Remember, rem uh, let me remind you, that if they vote and say we accept this measure, it would wipe out their wealth. How many states said yes, you think, out of the 13? One. One. 